One of the greatest aspects of Smash Brothers has always been the large assortment of unique characters and worlds that can be experienced within its games. Each stage is effectively a visual microcosm of the game world that it represents, and offers players a glimpse into what that world is like. But considering the sheer variety of genres on offer, how are stages like the Great Plateau Tower, a representation of an open world game, even possible to bring over to a fighting game like Smash Brothers Ultimate? Well that's exactly what we'll be looking into today in this episode of Smash Labs. While this background might look like a convincing replica of the world of Hyrule, I can assure you that that's not the case. And if you've seen Andre's video on developer tricks you weren't meant to see in Smash Ultimate, you probably have a pretty good idea of why it isn't. As you can imagine, with many different game worlds and art styles to represent, a game like Smash Ultimate has to be developed with specific constraints in mind, namely that there is a harder limit to the quantity and quality of the assets that can be ported over or authored for a game like this. On the other hand, Smash games don't involve players actually exploring the game worlds that they play in, so as long as the background for each stage only has to look the part, they can usually get away with conveying a lot more while using a lot less. In the case of the Great Plateau Tower and the field of view that it covers, it seems reasonable to assume that porting over game world assets from Breath of the Wild to be used as a backdrop for the stage would not be a viable option. And yet, here we are looking at a gorgeous, lifelike vista that seems to be lifted directly from the game. Nevertheless, this backdrop is indeed an illusion, and one that you'll find a lot of the sages have in common. For the Great Plateau Tower in particular, the scale of the original game world meant that most of the world had to be presented in the form of a cube map skybox when being represented in Smash, where its distant details could not be closely scrutinized. Technically, there are six main textures mapped to a cuboidal mesh, and each side of this mesh represents a different point of view from which a scene has been captured at a focal length to infinity. These different images then come together as a skybox to make a single background like we see here. Forming the background in this way allows the developers to convey a sense of depth with the illusion that wouldn't be as effective if the background were captured from only one point of view. Having said that, this backdrop isn't without its drawbacks. For one, stitching together six different textures for a skybox can often lead to visible seams in the background, even when angular distortion is used to round out the edges, like in this section where we see that a portion of the cloud is missing. Another problem is the lack of motion parallax between different regions in the background. In Breath of the Wild, the trees and hills just beyond the plateau are much closer closer to the camera than the mountains on the horizon, and the parallax that we see when different parts of the environment move at different speeds is yet another depth cue we can use to perceive our surroundings in three dimensions. Unfortunately, we're dealing with just flat images in Smash Ultimate, which means there can't be any motion parallax for images that are captured as if the background were infinitely far away, which is why this shot looks completely static even though the camera's actually panning right now. And this is just one of the compromises that needed to be made in order to visually represent a game as technically robust as Breath of the Wild, and another game that's running at double the frame rate and a higher resolution, and does so a lot more consistently than Breath of the Wild did running at 900p and 30fps. When comparing the Great Plateau Tower stage and backdrop to Breath of the Wild directly, we can see that there are quite a few features and effects from the original game that are completely absent in the Smash incarnation, such as the simulated real-time Rayleigh scattering and time of day that allows for that gorgeous hemisphere to environment lighting during sunsets, dynamically emissive materials, or the me scattering effects responsible for atmospheric haze and volumetric lighting, wind simulation, torrential rainfall, and other weather effects are also notably absent in the Smash version. So with so many cutbacks needed to deliver this game world with a 1080p 60 frames per second presentation, you might be wondering what visual features the stage has managed to preserve from the original, besides the incredible vista looming in the distance that is. But rest assured that the Smash Ultimate version does have a few tricks up its sleeve. For one, with the exception of dynamic objects like destructible environments or items and characters, all of the lighting and shadows for most stages in Smash Ultimate were baked into the texture data while the game was still in development, and the Great Plateau Tower is no exception. However, due to certain artifacts common with real-time shadow cascades that haven't been specifically filtered to correct such artifacts, it's actually fairly easy to tell which shadows in Smash Ultimate are rendered in real-time and which ones are not, even if the environment and time of day is completely static. In Smash Ultimate, if you see the edges of a shadow move as you rotate the camera, independent of the material the shadow is cast upon, you're looking at a shadow dynamically rendered in real-time. If you rotate the camera and the edges of a shadow remain static, then you're likely looking at a shadow that has been baked into the texture data. You'll also notice that the edges of the baked shadows are a bit softer than the real-time shadows due to being pre-filtered. 
Another optimization for this stage is one that might seem counterintuitive at first glance, and that is the lack of aggressive mip mapping or level of detail bias compared to Breath of the Wild. We can see this with the texture shimmering here as the Smash versions of these textures have higher frequency detail compared to Breath of the Wild's textures at this distance from the camera. Ideally, with mip mapping, you should actually save on performance by using lower resolution versions of a higher resolution texture, usually by subsequent powers of 2, the farther the texture is from the camera. However, including a large number of mip maps for every texture adds to the amount of texture data that has to be loaded into memory. So it's probably safe to assume that Bandai Namco tried to get away with using as little mip map as possible in the background to reduce load times when selecting a stage and characters. And in a game like Smash Ultimate, such a decision wouldn't really impact performance in a negative way, since normal gameplay doesn't involve traversing the background environment, so there's no need to change the level of detail. In fact, I'd say it would be pretty inefficient to include texture data for a change of level of detail that never actually occurs during gameplay, regardless of potential load times. And speaking of detail, it would seem as if normal mapping was the tech artist's best friend when crafting the Great Plateau Tower, as it appears to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting and conveying surface detail for materials in place of actual geometry. And considering the limited camera perspective in which Smash Bros. games are played, I would say that the use of normal maps whenever possible was a very smart approach to designing this stage on a technical level. One thing I've always found interesting about Breath of the Wild from an artistic perspective is just how diffusely reflective most of the materials are instead of there being more specularly reflective materials to spruce up the presentation. There's a general lack of clear direction with respect to the light source's position when looking at most of the materials, with the exception of the water and certain shrine materials, and they end up looking very evenly lit as a result. This artistic design is actually intentional. Considering the post-apocalyptic setting, it makes sense that a world that is now overrun by nature should be largely earthly and dusty looking. Even most metals will have been highly oxidized sitting there for so long, and the more rough the top layer of a material is, the more diffusely it will reflect light. So while there isn't much in the way of sparkle and shine for the Great Plateau Tower, it certainly does a great job in conveying the overall visual impression you get when playing Breath of the Wild. And even still, there are some visual elements like Fresnel reflections visible on materials where it makes sense. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how the Great Plateau Tower turned out in Smash Bros. Ultimate, even if I do feel that having a few more dynamic elements such as time of day and weather like we see on the pirate ship stage would bring this stage that much closer to feeling like you're playing in Breath of the Wild. And that's all we have time for today in this episode of Smash Labs. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to give it a like and share your thoughts with us in the comments below. There's still a lot more to reveal in the weeks and months to come, so hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and be sure to stay tuned to Game Explained for more coverage on all things gaming. Cheers!